So today I'm going to be sharing some, some data we've collected quite recently in collaboration with a few people in the LMP field, p and I included. And we're going to look at sort of novel data that we can we can we can get by nanoflow cytometry, giving greater insight into uh, the particle populations that we're creating uh, during LMP formulation. Now, obviously, part of this uh, part of this data is going to be including um, the conventional uh, analytical methods such as the DLS and the ribo green assay. And I'm going to start with a little bit of an explanation of how nanoflow cytometry works and how we're able to get orthogonal data showing the, the particle sizing, the particle concentration, and these, on top of this, these novel data units, this loading ratio, describing the LMPs which have successfully encapsulated RNA, and describing the way that the payload is distributed. So we can, we can start to talk about the quantification of the RNA per LMP. So this is all quite, quite exciting ways to look at uh, our formulations. So to, to, to just demonstrate, like, how, how we're analyzing the particles. It is, it is, it's nanoflow cytometry. So if you've got a background in flat flow cytometry, you'll, you'll understand this very simply. But the, the sample stream, our, our, our LMP formulation is uh, injected into the system. And, uh, the, the sample stream is narrowed into a very small diameter to allow for single particle by particle detection. So each, in, each particle is interacting with the laser one at a time. And we're detecting, um, in three three per parameters here. So we've got first in blue, the size gap detection, where we're identifying the particle, we're counting it and sizing it. And then from this, we're gonna build up the, the data with two up to two fluorescence channels. Uh, the fluorescence is gonna tell us something about the, the various cargos or surface presented molecules, depending on our um, labeling options. So most of the data I'm gonna to show today is using uh, nucleic acid labeling. So membrane permeable dyes which fluoresce in contact with nucleic acids. And so by doing this, we get, we start to build uh, a step-by-step -step analysis um, of these particles. We get, we're, we're analyzing thousands of particles in a single minute runtime, allowing us to create these nice like, size distribution um, histograms and get all the average sizing data and get the concentration as well. And then as, an, as I've just mentioned, we use these nucleic acid dyes to identify the particles which carry our RNA and we can begin to quantify this in terms of mRNA copies per LMP. So, just to show, just to show you what that what that ends up looking like, um, I've got here just a one a, a, an image of the dot plot that is um, uh, churned out during nanoflow cytometry. So we've got along the the x axis we've got it says side scatter, and along the y axis we've got the uh, the fluorescence, and this is relative to the size of the particle, and on the y axis. Uh, relative to the quantity of uh, RNA that is encapsulated. And each of the dots on these dot plots represents a single particle that has been measured in a one minute runtime. As you can see, when, when we're loading in particles which don't have any RNA, we have no um, interaction with the dye. Uh, everything remains uh, uh, negative. But when we start to use a sample where we have encapsulated RNA, we see this really clear distinction uh, in these two populations. And what this means is that we can describe things in terms of relative ratios. So we can describe the, the proportion of particles which are loaded, uh, but we can also describe the, um, the, the concentration and the uh, sizes of these unique populations. So um, we get, we get you know, quantifiable units of particles per mil or the diameter in, in nanometers for each unique population. And these, these unique populations which we can identify can be built up with different fluorescent techniques. Um, so we can utilize both fluorescent channels, for instance, to show whether our, our LMPs with a, a sort of a, a surface targeting moiety uh, might also be, be um, uh, correctly uh, encapsulating our, our particular cargos, or we can see if two cargos have been encapsulated by the same particle. And so the last thing that I want to just very quickly explain is how we quantify the, uh, the amount of RNA per LMP. So, before I was speaking that we see every particle as it flows past the laser. But if we, if we switch to something called fluorescent triggering, uh, we can identify every uh, single mRNA copy as it flows past the laser as well, so long as the uh, mRNA is longer than a thousand nucleotides. By taking the average fluorescence of these, uh, of these single mRNAs, we get to build up a profile of the RNA contained in each of the LMPs. 
And so I'm going to be showing a little bit of data uh, of how we present this, but mostly we like to present it with these nice histograms sort of demonstrating the, the spread of the, the RNA throughout the particle population. We can also get a sort of average data as well. And so with that, um, I'd like to just jump straight into to talking about the, the novel ways we've been able to produce um, uh, nanoflux cytometry data in, in with collaborations with, first of all, Vax Equity. So Vax Equity works with um, self uh, amplifying RNA. And uh, so this is a really cool RNA species and uh, upon delivery to the cell, it's, go it's going to, uh, as I say, amplify and we're going to have a larger sort of cohort of the um, mRNA inside the cell, allowing for increased protein expression. This does come at the cost of having to work with a slightly larger uh, nucleic acid. So it's a, it's a longer in terms of nucleotide length than, it, than the standard mRNA. And uh, uh, I met George, uh, George Lacroix at uh, Vax Equity in a conference, and he was really interested in whether or not these, these new RNA species would interact differently with ionized lipids, and if we could sort of uh, determine this unique interaction. So I'm going to share data from the panel that we've got here, where we're looking at two different ionized lipids, uh, and the formulations are generated with uh, different MP ratios, so different ionizable lipid to RNA uh, ratios. Of course, the, the first thing you have to do is all the conventional stuff. So by DLS, we can see that the, the particles are of a, of a nice size. Um, so they're formulating the particle on the ignite system, and we're getting uh, nice nice sizing across all these different MP ratios. There's no real trend in the size by DLS to the uh, MP ratio. And when we get the sort of orthogonal data by the nanoflow cytometry, we again don't see any trend. We see particles uh, uh, in that nice size range, slightly smaller as determined by Nano FCM, but this comes down to the single particle analyses. The next thing that we get to look at is the ribogreen encapsulation efficiency. And once again, you can see that uh, across the different MP ratios in both lipids, we don't really see a trend uh, relating to the MP ratio. And this is backed up uh, once again by the nanoflow cytometry data. Across everything, we do get really nice high uh, encapsulation efficiency, uh, as, you, as you'd expect in this kind of microfluidic, microfluidic formulation but nothing relating to the trend. This is, of course, where, where the additional um, data that we get from nanoflow cytometry comes into play, and we start to look into the loading ratio of these particles. And so what you can see that in both formulations using the lipid one or, or ionizable lipid three, we get to see this um, uh, trend that as we increase the MP ratio, so more uh, lipid to RNA, we get this reduction in the proportion of loaded particles. <laughs> And what, what George pointed out to me was that it might actually be better to describe this in terms of the proportion of unloaded material. So the unloaded material, uh, the unloaded LPs rather, they present two that interesting points. First of all, you've got uh, a uh, wasted reagent, right? You're wasting uh, lipid and ionizable lipid here and generating these particles with potentially showing that no therapeutic effect. And on the other hand, another way to think about this as well is that these, are, these could still have an immunogenic effect, uh, which would be uh, unwanted in many in many delivery systems. In in vaccines, maybe this would be act as an adjuvant, but in other in other um, delivery methods, we're not we're not seeking to to have these um, non therapeutically beneficial particles in a system. So this is a very very simple way to to understand what's happening with our particles. Uh, I, I understand this as we have too much lipid and we we, we don't have enough RNA, so. The particles that we're forming are, are, are empty and can be less therapeutically active. So, we were able to build upon this kind of analysis with the work that we did uh, uh, with PNI. Uh, Edward was a very gracious host to one of our junior researchers, um, Joe. And the first part of the, the results that, that uh, Joe was able to collect is this MP ratio series. So, again, we're using the, the Ignite system here with the, with the flow rate settings um, shown on the screen. Uh, I'm sure it means a lot more to too many of the people here than it does to me. Um, but we're going to we're going to look at how this MP ratio affects mRNA and MP formulations. And once again, I'm going to start by talking about the the normal stuff. Particle sizing is is uh, the same across these four different formulations from MP4 to MP12. Even when we look at the nanoflow data and we try and separate out the loaded uh, population size and the unloaded population size, there's really not too much to discuss. High encapsulation efficiency, as we as we saw previously, uh, it's quite common with the microfluidics. And the last thing here is the loading ratio. And 
I was expecting to see a bit of a more significant impact of the uh, MP ratio on the on the uh, percentage of loaded particles here. But as you can see, even at MP8 and MP12, we're not seeing a, a massive increase in this empty NMP um, population. So slightly different from what we were seeing with the other RNA species. But of course, there's a reason I wanted to share this data, and it's because as we get into uh, describing the RNA quantity that's loaded into these particles, we can start to see some significant differences. So once again, I'm showing the dot plots and for two formulations on the screen here. On the left, you've got the MP4, and on the right, you've got the MP12. Size of the particles um, on the x-axis and fluorescence uh, representing the RNA quantity on the y-axis. And I've marked out just a, 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 a dashed line here to show that there's in the MP4 population, there's there's quite a lot of these particles which are, uh, are more fluorescent and therefore are holding more RNA. If we start to actually quantify the amount of RNA being contained by these LMPs, we get to see this really nice uh, gradation of, um, of mRNA copies as we increase the uh, MP ratio. Another way to sort of display this data is to look at the histograms. And so you can see here that with the... Uh, We'll start with looking at the, the MP4 uh, histogram in blue. We might have sort of larger copy numbers in general, um, but we have quite a, a wide spread of, um, of this histogram. Okay, so, so more heterogeneity in the amount of RNA that is contained. Whereas in the MP12, yes, we've got sort of fewer copy numbers uh, in general in, contained by these LMPs, but you could describe this as well as a more homogeneous sort of distribution of the RNA, giving us sort of two parameters that we can begin to explore with this novel uh, sort of nanoflow cytometry approach. Something um, that we went uh, uh, even further to look into this data, um, because from the dot plots that we can see, there is a, it looks to be a significant correlation between the size and the fluorescence on the MP4, but not the MP12. And so we, we came up with a, a way to sort of, ex to describe this relationship. So, what we've done is because we've measured, measured each particle for its size and its RNA um, quantity, um, we've ranked each of those particles uh, for their size and their copy numbers. So sizes along the x-axis and copy number along the y, just like the dot plots. And you can see that for this MP12 population, this high um, ionizable lipid to RNA uh, ratio, there's not very, very much correlation, a small, small correlation um, uh, where, where there's more RNA held by the the um, larger particle. However, it's a, it's a quite a different story when we move over to the MP4, uh, where we can see really nice correlation. Uh, as the particles are larger, they're also able to contain um, more RNA. And this is, this is kind of to be expected, but tells a really nice story of the way that the RNA is distributed um, during um, particle development in, in this formulation process. The using the microfluidics, we can see that um, when there is accessible RNA, those ionized lipids are, 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 are binding to the, um, to the RNA and we're able to form um, particles surrounding as much RNA as possible. And you see that this effect is seeing seen a really nice um, gradual pattern here in this bar graph as we increase the MP ratio. So I thought this was a really good way to, to understand what's happening in these different formulation parameters. The next thing I want to talk about is this mixing method comparison. So we're taking the uh, Ignite platform and the, and the Ignite Plus this, and comparing this sort of microfluidic approach to uh, mixing the ionized lipid and the, uh, and the RNA. And we're comparing it to sort of the conventional vortex mixing and the hand mixing that we might be doing in your lab. Um, so what we were able to do as well was, was take three batches of, of each of these formulations, except for the uh, Ignite Plus, as, as it would have required a lot more reagent for us. It's obviously got a much larger um, uh, production capacity. But with the other three, we've got sort of a batch three analysis here. And by, by using the DLS, we can immediately see that there is that, that there are some differences in the particle sizing. So we can see that the, the vortex mix and hand mix, you get larger particles uh, produced. So it's interesting when you start to look at the other parameters as well. When we look at the ribogreen encapsulation efficiency, we can see that we, we failed to capture all the RNA in the vortex mix and hand mixed methods compared to the sort of microfluidic approach. Um, you get, also get this sort of great variation between batches, which was it was difficult to reproduce the same batch um, using this, this vortex approach. So we've wasted some RNA here. It's not getting inside. It's, not, it's, not, it, it's remaining outside somewhere. 
building on this with the with the unique sort of uh, nanoflow data, we we get to see that we've got loaded uh, we've got loaded and empty particles in the vortex and hand mix, but the majority of particles are loaded when we do the when we use the ignite platform. So this is already starting to build a story of what's happening between these these lipids and the um, and the RNA. Um, something as well that I thought was was quite interesting. At first, I looked at this this graph and saw that everything the, the medium copy number for these um, LMPs that are produced is very similar, right? But the, the thing that actually stands out is that we've got quite large error bars here for the vortex mix and hand mix, you know, showing low reproducibility uh, compared to the um, ignite approach. So putting this all together, I think we can start to start to describe what's really, what's what's happening um, between these two different types of LMP formulation when we're using sort of the vortex mixing and hand mixing approach, it's as if the, the ionizable lipid and the and the RNA aren't, aren't meeting each other at the right point. The particles are starting to, to develop, um, which is why we're getting these empty LMPs uh, before there's proper interaction between the ionizable lipid and the RNA. And that's, that's likely part of the reason why we end up with uh, RNA being unencapsulated and get this poor uh, encapsulation efficiency. So a really cool way to describe the differences between these these approaches and kind of highlighting that that in an environment like the microfluidics there is there's really good controlled interaction between these two components allowing for good uh, reproducible formation of loaded and like the active lmps and so hopefully this data is sort of giving you a good idea of how we build up this corroborative data um you know, working with, alongside the dls and the rather green assays showing the size uh, uh, encapsulation efficiency and then we go a little step further start to build up with these novel units this could be particles per mil concentration but really key uh, to the data shown here today was that loaded empty particle ratio and i think the, the ability to quantify your rna payloads is something we've all been wanting to do for a long time now so it's really uh, it's really great that we get to show some of that data here today uh, and it's, it's going to be really important for, for what we actually select as our leading formulations i think you know we, we were sort of able to show that with a depending on your um your formulation process you can end up with a lot of wasted reagents and these can potentially depending on what in your delivery method could be considered contaminants so the empty lps are likely to have an immunogenic immunogenic effect that is unwanted and being able to describe that rna payload gives us the option to to select you know, high RNA yield populations, high RNA yield um, formulations rather, and compare that to maybe uh, formulations with, with greater uh, homogeneity of their um, RNA payload. So with that, I'd just like to take a second just to thank everybody who was involved. The team of Act Equity was absolutely fantastic to work with, um, George leading the team. Uh, we got loads of great data. It was always good to talk with them about it. Uh, Edward was a fantastic host with uh, PNI for Joe. He, he brought back loads of information about how how we can use their systems and stuff. And of course, the team back here at Nano FCM uh, with Joe and Becky doing doing a lot of the lab work. Uh, they were churning out fantastic data, and we're really lucky to have them. So I uh, just like to thank everyone as well for listening, and I look forward to taking questions. Thank you.